All right. <clears throat> well, how is everyone today? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. <clears throat> Wherever you are in the world, and hopefully things are streaming as planned. Having some little weird YouTube glitches going on here. So um, looks like hopefully everything is uh, it's kicking in just fine. It appears to be that way. So, all right, very good. Well, thank you so much for joining me. My name is Jason Levine, and for today's live stream, uh, we hope, <laughs> going to be uh, talking about recording and uh, largely mixing with plugins, finishing off the soundtrack that I composed a couple of weeks ago to the Jason versus Pennywise video extravaganza that, uh, <laughs> that a very young YouTuber created and I got inspired to mix and edit or assist in editing for him. So as always, we're coming to you live, uh, not as, as many places today because um, things were just acting really strange. So in any case, we are on Adobe Live, Behance and uh, my YouTube channel. So thank you so much for joining. Uh, Kresimir, nice to see you. Koji TV, Donald Ping, how's it going? Africa Motivation, Evan Didio, what's up? Wade Howard. Joe Dorgu, hello. Umicorn Browers, how's it going? Rashida. Yeah, Howard, we're, YouTube glitch is unheard of. Yeah, we, YouTube was giving you all these messages. Unable to stream now, retry. But it was previewing, but I wasn't seeing the preview. So yeah, it's going to be one of those days. I felt it earlier. OK, so uh, without further ado, why don't we go ahead and kick in. By the way, for those of you joining on my, my YouTube channel, I will be following the chat over at behance.net slash Adobe Live. So if you want to uh, be live in the chat with me, that's the one I'm going to be reading in real time. I'll try and click back where I can, but uh, that's the one I'm going to be following largely for the next hour or so. And then we've got Andrew coming up, I believe, with the um, Illustrator uh, Daily Creative Challenge following that. OK, so let me go ahead and switch over my screen here. Looks like everything's rolling. And uh, here's kind of where we left off. So a couple weeks ago, uh, we were doing some live, live scoring to picture. This is the picture in question. And I laid down um, <clears throat> a couple of different tracks of some live strings, some cellos, some staccato and very just sort of abrupt, creepy sounding things, largely um, separated. I wasn't actually monitoring the pieces as I was laying them down by design. I was using native instruments to provide the samples and I was playing them live on the keyboards over here. So, um, and then I also added some Moog and some piano as well on this last track. So part of what's going to be happening today is we're not only going to EQ and kind of finesse and work with the actual mixing part of it, but also a little bit of recomposing of some of these things because I didn't quite, I, I neglected for whatever reason that day. I think I was just distracted. Um, to set markers. So I went I went a bit over in some parts. Everything wasn't kind of in sync, although there's some nice moments where things kind of work together. So just real quickly to kind of let you hear all the elements that are happening in this piece, start with a little bit of some uh, strings, which I think are just playing kind of a minor second, very high up, uh, higher octaves, uh, some violins, maybe a little bit of viola introduced there. And these are currently routed through uh, a reverb send, a reverb bus as well, uh, using our classic native studio reverb. Now, where possible today, I will, I may use some native plugins, but for the most part, I'm probably going to be using third-party ones just because for these kinds of mixes, particularly classical instrumentation, I kind of like them. And there's a purpose to this, which I'll talk about in a bit, which is really being able to kind of leverage presets as a starting point. <laughs> Get back to that in a second. So let's kind of just listen to, well, I guess we can kind of listen to everything as it is right now. <laughs> it's kind of a big mess. And uh, then I'll kind of break it down. But let, let's, I'll, maybe I'll just bring things in slowly, all right? So we start with some violins. Pretty classic, classic horror. And then from there, we're going to go into some legato cellos and some tremolo. And then we've got some staccato strings here. Put 
gonna? Where's my cheese? And then the mode. Hey, cheese, got no cheese. Thank you guys. Okay. So, and I haven't really decided. He, he's saying his thank. It was a very short, short film. <laughs> it's, it's one minute. Um, but what's interesting is I was listening back yesterday. There's this really nice moment. You can, you can even see here. Now the, the violins are continuous. There's a part where I stop the tremolo cellos, the staccatos stop. I did I did a, an overdub. I just kind of added because I got an idea, and the Moog kept going. But I did this sort of glissando to kind of glue it together. This just happened live. Sounds really cool right in that section. So I kind of want to preserve that. If you take a listen here. I guess they didn't have any kids. This is this really neat, like. <laughs> and it, it kind of works. It really kind of works with that staccato craziness right there. If you take a listen. <laughs> Okay, so in any case, we're going to focus on starting with just a bit of equalization and some treatment to these things, and then we'll get into the recomposition. I don't know if we're gonna have time for all of it, to be honest. I, I, I promised uh, I promised that little dude that I'd have this finished, but uh, <laughs> as Tim Harden once sang, don't make promises you can't keep. <laughs> Sorry, son, it just might not happen today. All right, so let's start with the strings, okay. Now, one of the things you got to keep in mind is when you're using uh, soft synths or virtual instruments as I did here, even though I'm playing these, part of the brilliance of samples nowadays, you know, and they're individually sampled every note, every articulation, so that when you play them on a keyboard like I did, you can really be very expressive and it sounds just unbelievably realistic. But part of what you're getting there, and you can of course disable all of this, but the nature of what makes these things sound so good is that they're already treated. They're already equalized. They're usually already going through some kind of uh, processing, whether it's reverb, whether it's EQ, something. So there's a couple things you have to think about. First of all, you know, if you start adding a lot of these over top of one another, and in this case, because all of the strings came from the same collection of strings. Now you have different string presets, some are, you know, like 70s Motown. They have, of course, a very different equalization and echo than modern strings versus studio. You know, there's all these different presets that use different, their own different EQs, compressors, and reverbs. I didn't change the string set. So these all effectively have kind of the same EQ, the same native room ambience and reverb. And because of that, when you start to overdub and add these things over top of themselves, you're kind of clouding up the space. It's not that it sounds bad, but they all kind of have the same EQ curve. And if you imagine, if you're an illustrator or someone in design, it would be like just kind of overlaying the same, the same primary color, but with a slight variation over top of itself, right? Eventually you're just gonna, you know, if you keep doing that with reds, it's, it's just gonna look like a really dark, a really intense red, you know? So much so that if you put anything else in there, if it's so intense, you might not see it, right? Conceptually, it's kind of the same thing here. So one of the things that I like to do, because I did take advantage of using whatever spatial uh, reverb was already on there and just kind of the, the pre-factored in EQ, it's a, it's a process to disable all of those things, by the way, um, is we want to just kind of be careful that we, we pay attention to really what what are we trying to bring out in each of these samples? So this is already going through a reverb bus. I'm going to mute the reverb bus for the moment, and maybe I'll take the video and stick it back over here. I'm just gonna re reorganize our, uh, our panels a little bit and give me a little bit more working, working area inside of the mixer here. 
I have to say, I really, I really enjoy the way that we've kind of re retooled audi auditions UI. Um, start with those strings, and let's just kind of take a listen to what these sound like raw. And again, it's key to to em emphasize that right now uh, it's we've got the reverb muted, so we're just going to hear the native strings by themselves. And again, you can really hear the bowing in there. And I'm just going to do this. I always do this for the stream. I'm going to stick a little um, uh, limiter on the end of this. Uh, let's do ultra stereo, just to um, just to amplify over the stream. Because obviously, I'm not going to mix all of these things equally as loud, but. Uh, Let's do ultra shaping. Let's see with a threshold of minus 10. That should give us some nice amplitude. Let's see here. It's just going to make everything a little bit louder for you. Okay. So Again, now, there's a couple things that we can do here. As always, we have our native parametric EQ in Audition. So this is present on every track. Uh, you don't have to install it or add it. It's already there by default. And this equalization happens, it's important to note, after you add any effects inserts. So you obviously have the option here to insert additional native equalizers or third-party ones, VST, AU, VST3. All right, and then it's after the send. All right, so it's EQing after these two things here, and of course after the send, depending upon if it's pre fader or post fader. Uh, so in this case, if we double click here, this will pull up that parametric equalizer. Now this one I really like. It's very clean. It's very quiet. I don't actually love it for strings. It's a little too clinical for strings, and part of part of what makes strings sing for lack of a better word for my international audience. What's up, Leafy? Nice to see you. Part of what makes strings really pop is having very specific equalizers that really cater to mid and upper mid-range sounds. Um, a lot of classic EQ emulations will kind of help you with this. Now, I don't even know if we have, I don't know if we have any presets built in for classical instrumentation, but the range that we're kind of looking to focus on here is somewhere between, say, Again, it's kind of mid-range and upper mids, 900 to 1,000 hertz, probably all the way up to around 2,500, 3K. That's where you're going to kind of really bring out that string sound. And again, just uh, a, bit of, a bit of that, you, you want to be able to hear the, uh, hear the bowing, right? So let's just start with this and take a quick listen here, all right? Wind it back a little bit. And if it's too loud, let me know. A little loud for me. Now, if you're listening, there's kind of this that's that's the bow, all right. <laughs> now we could, you know, we could effectively pull a little bit of that out if we want to. What you can see here is that I've just raised this by about four decibels at around 2,600 hertz with a Q value of four. Your Q value, of course, is your band width. The uh, the higher the value, the smaller uh, the bandwidth, meaning that you're affecting fewer of the frequencies on either side. The, uh, the lower the number, the wider the bandwidth, meaning that you're affecting more frequencies to the left and right. This is effectively your center frequency. So if I wanted to widen this and really kind of accentuate more, if you're taking a look on screen here, you can see that as I adjust this, right, so smaller numbers, this would be like if we're trying to really eliminate a buzz or a ping or some kind of weird, like a ring on a snare drum. But if we want to kind of affect more frequencies, we're going to go a little bit wider, maybe a Q of around 0.9. In this case, I've got it around 4, all right? And it just kind of gives it a little bit of a bump, 
all right, to kind of bring out the presence of those strings. It's before, after. So that sounds okay, just a little bit, a little subtlety to kind of just bring out a little bit more of kind of the fundamentals of those sounds. And you can see on the frequency graph here kind of where things are really present. And right here, again, some of the fundamentals of the notes that I'm playing, you can see the octaves around 600, 1200, 2400. Uh, again, here's kind of another, uh, another harmonic in there of around 3K. 4400k give or take so you're really seeing all the harmonics that are being affected here that are present and that's what we're accentuating so we're kind of using a combination of looking and listening all right so this works out nicely now what's going to change this is when i send this into the reverb now in this particular one i wanted to use kind of a darker hall you can see you've got a nice long decay going on here a little bit of reflection and i'm rolling off everything above 4000 hertz so i don't want it to be super high-endy, like cut your ears, like sounds like slicing. I want it to feel a little bit darker. We're not reverberating anything below 300 hertz, so no bass frequencies are reverberated here. We're damping the whole thing. So again, we're softening some of the high end there and we're allowing it to diffuse. 70% is kind of pretty standard for classical instrumentation. And because I'm using this as a pre-fader send, meaning that I'm sending the signal of these strings before the fader, to this reverb, I have independent control of the dry signal on the fader here, all right, and the wet reverberated signal here, okay? So let's go ahead and drag this all the way down. Let's unmute this. All right, you can see I'm sending not terribly much. I'm also panning the signal a little bit to the right, so the reverberation is going to happen a little bit more on the right side. Oh, and by the way, do I have let me make sure I don't have any. Okay, I don't. I don't have any noise reduction on here. All right, let's uh, let's see what this sounds like once I add that reverb in. And again, now it's going to kind of darken it and take off a little bit of that edge. I got to wind it back. We're going to run out of run out of strings here. All right now, let's pull out the dry signal. Do you hear the difference? Now we've kind of created this like dark, creepy pad. We can bring in some more of the direct sound. All right. And it just kind of now it kind of floats. If we want to actually move this back. Let's see how it works a little bit more with the panning. Oh, what's up, Scott Belsky? <laughs> You're only just hearing strings, Dad. These little, these little uh, violins. It'll get really interesting once we bring in the tremolos. Okay, and maybe what we'll do now is we'll automate the dry sound of those violins kind of coming in over time. So again, we kind of start, it's a horror, it's a horror short. So I like it where, you know, you're not getting any of the direct sound originally. Let's unmute this. And then slowly start to bring the fader in. where it almost becomes piercing, right? We're trying to really punctuate this thing, punctuate the visual, punctuate with sound. Now you can do this in a number of ways. The easiest way, of course, is just to enable write mode right here. And for the moment, without EQ, I'm gonna leave those legato tremolo cellos on here so I can be sort of guided by those, all right? So let's start with everything down at zero. Let's go into write mode. Let's start the playback here. And now as I adjust that fader, it's going to be capturing all of my 
all of my movements, everything that I'm doing in the mixer right here, it's recording all of those actions. So we're doing basically a live action record in Photoshop in Audition, trying to make it equivalent to Photoshop actions. Okay, here we go. Let it ride. Okay. <laughs> All right, so now if we were to look inside of our automation lanes here, now what you're seeing, you see all this motion here? That's my fader movement, okay? And each of those represents an editable keyframe. So if we wanted to tweak any one of these, you can see the actual vo the decibel levels of each one of these. I can now tweak those independently, individually at any point in time, all right? Pretty cool. All right, so let's, let's keep that as it is. I think that sounds pretty good. Now, again, I can also adjust the reverb setting on there in and out, but I think that's a good starting place. All right, so let's go ahead and just mute that for a moment. And let's focus on some of those legato tremolos and where we're going to place these staccato ones as well. <laughs> this was my mood yesterday with my children. Let me just tell you right now. <laughs> Parents, you'll understand what I mean. The quarantine is getting to me. All right. So now for this, this is where we're going to bring a little third party plug in here, okay? So this has the same basic equalization as I was describing before. So the key here is we want to change up this sound. If we're going to use the same parametric, again, it's like layering red on top of red on top of red. We're just, it's going to be additive and we're not going to be able to carve out enough space. And each of these parts are doing very different things, right? So for this, I'm going to turn to um, one of my favorite Waves plugins which is something called the Red Console. So let's go into VST3 under EQ Waves, and, or no, maybe it's not under EQ, maybe it's under Effect. Yes, under Effect. And we're gonna go into the Red 3751 Stereo. So these consoles very famously were used at uh, EMI and Abbey Road Studios in the 60s, and um, most specifically on Beatle Records, among many others, Kinks and, 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 and countless others in the mid 60s. What's unique about these, first of all, is that you can see it's a very simple, uh, it's a very simple, simple equalization uh, series of parameters. So you have the type of amplifier that's being used. So of course, these are all tube based. So this is using tube based algorithmic emulation. Red 37 are the uh, early 60s model. The Red 51, that's the mid 60s model. You've got channel gain, you've got bass lift, okay, not unlike what we have uh, in our parametric. You can link the channels together, which we will. We don't need independent left and right. We want them linked. But what was unique about these was that they had two, they had basically a, this is not actually what it looked like. I believe it was a, 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 a toggle knob. You have classical EQ and pop EQ. Now, if that doesn't say 60s, I don't know what else does. <laughs> That's basically what it was. It's like, okay, you're doing pop music, you're doing classical music. And based on what you choose here, not surprising that the classical is going to be a little bit warmer, is going to have a little less high end, it'll be a little, little more uh, um, full 
full bandwidth and a little less harsh. The pop stuff's gonna be a little brighter. It's gonna focus a bit more on the upper mid range, specifically around 4,500 Hertz. That's kind of that AM radio key frequency for vocals to really push through. Um, so we're gonna work with this. And then of course, you've got two additional things here in the form of drive. So this is gonna add a little analog uh, distortion to this, as well as the analog setting, which is a combination. So drive is actually how hard it's hitting the preamp circuitry of this EQ. And then analog is gonna add just a little bit more warmth there. Now you've also got the option here to run this in true stereo, dual channel mono or mid side stereo. So again, maybe we'll try the mid side option to see how it sounds on this already stereo recorded cello section that I played. But we're gonna start, okay, with a, with a preset here. Now, I like to encourage using presets of our own as well as third party ones for a couple of reasons. One, it's a good way to understand how these effects work and what they do. And also, you know, I'm not mixing this for David Fincher, so I can, I don't need to spend hours tweaking these things. You know, maybe a, maybe a preset's gonna do it. There's nothing wrong with that. Terry White, my dear friend, has always said, presets mean goodness. You're not, you're not taking the easy, you're not cheaping out, you're not like sacrificing. Almost every preset needs to be slightly tweaked anyway. Seldom do you find one where you just turn it on and it just is perfect, though that does happen. So there's nothing wrong with experimenting with the stuff that's in here. Now, the vintage cello one, I, I've, I've used that in the past. Notice that when I choose vintage cello, it goes to the classical EQ. Now, even though we've got some high tone boost here, we've also got an enormous amount of low tone boost. Notice it's just boost cut. So you don't even have frequency selection here. There's no, it's not, it's not parametric. Okay, the frequencies are predefined, which is key to the sound of these old equalizers. Having used this before, I can tell you it's very, very warm, probably too warm. So let's start with just the cellos by themselves and then we'll turn this on and you'll hear what I'm talking about. And I'll, and I'll get to your question in one second, Michael. Okay, so this is off. Let's tick it, kick it in. And you can see, first of all, it, the signal is way too hot, all right? So we need to back off on the gain here. Okay, so like I said, you throw a preset on, you're like, ah, oh, it sounds like garbage. Well, yeah, because the preset doesn't know what your gain structure is. This is hot. This was recorded super hot by design. I wouldn't record an acoustic cello with a single microphone like this, but this was a, you know, a, I'm playing a, a cello orchestra with my 10 fingers, so it's hotter than normal, which means we've got to drop the gain here. Better. Without. So right away, you can hear that it's, we lose a lot of that upper mid-range definition, right? Kind of the nature of these kind of styled classical EQs. You can see it's using just a little bit of drive, no additional analog setting here. We're, we're, we're pushing this thing through these two preamps and you can hear it. You could hear when it was by the default setting, it just got very crunchy. We were, we were effectively distorting the tube circuitry, which can be nice, not typically so nice for a cello ensemble. Now, bass lift is just that. It's effectively, if you can kind of see it in the graph, we're, go we're going to eliminate some of that bass, right? Think of it, think of it like we're, we're, we're rolling it off, all right? But it's got two different settings here which are gonna characteristically change how it handles the bass. Now, if you're using something which is playing in the lower octaves on a cello, I, I tend to, unless it's playing something that's meant to be like a bass note, I tend to roll it off as well because it's going to, it's going to leave space for other things. Now, in this particular track, the only other element that has any kind of bass frequency going on is some of the Moog stuff that I was playing here. And you can see it, again, via the frequencies here. We've got some nice peaks at around 160 hertz. This is our low frequency information. Obviously on our, uh, our original strings here, 
no bass whatsoever, right? I'm playing high up in the octaves. And similarly, if we go to like the staccatos, now I am playing some low staccato notes every now and again. Right? But we're gonna use some compression to make those really punctuate. Almost, so that almost feels like a bass guitar. Okay? But where we have this constant, right? We gotta be careful. So we probably wanna lift a little bit of that. Bass lifts work different, by the way, on all different EQs, and they're gonna sound different. So we can hear what these sound like on these cellos. Also, I'm not super loving this vintage one. So let's go into this strings two. Now, curiously, you can see that this one is using the pop EQ, all right? It's cutting a lot of low frequency. It's adding a lot of highs, all right? This one is unlinked, curiously. All right, but let's hear what this sound. Oh, and it's also doing a mid-side stereo. So this is gonna change the, um, how these are represented in stereo as we're listening back. So let's start with it off and then take a listen here. And Umicorn, yes, the interfaces for these plugins are magnificent and they're designed to emulate and look like what the consoles did. In fact, these, these fader, this fader style, that, that's exactly what they looked like on these old consoles. Al almost identical, as well as the, um, the volume, uh, the volume unit meters, the VU meters here, really beautiful, perfect emulations. All right, so this is original, flat. Sec. I don't know why I was hitting high notes in there. Mid-side. Now let's bring these other strings in. This one is actually using a combination of the 37 and the 50 ones. I'm gonna switch this to the same ones here. Yeah, see now here in this case, when I'm going to the lift, we're actually accentuating some of that. And when we go to the pad, we're flattening it out. So based on the different, um, if we're using the 37 or the 51, there's a different characteristic. The 37s have a more early 60s kind of sound. It's, it's just, it, they all sound a bit more mid-range. Um, you know, bass was always a, a thing that you had to be very careful about because you didn't want the stylus um, to bounce 
when they were cutting vinyl. If you put too much bass on a record, you know, whether you're using pizzicatos in the case of classical or, or an electric bass guitar, there was too much accentuated bass, the needle could actually skip. So by nature, a lot of these things just had these very intense kind of roll-offs, which is also why you're not choosing frequencies here. They were sort of predefined for you. Um, this, has, this is sounding pretty good. I like that it's kind of mid-rangey and it's leaving some space. Now I kind of like the stereo a little better. Mid-side just gives such a different, very interesting kind of sound too. We're not going to use any lift at all. We're just focusing on, again, adding the highs and cutting some of the lows here. Nor, it does look like a cockpit <laughs> of a very old plane. <laughs> okay, all right, that's sounding pretty good. Now, the other thing, like I mentioned, that I would probably use on here, post-EQ <clears throat> or pre-EQ, the thing is, there's not a huge amount of... Um, not a huge amount of amplitude variance. So I don't want to kill this, although this actually looks... This looks to be a little hot now that I'm looking at this. I wonder if I, uh, I wonder if I distorted this at all. And I did. So you can see I've actually got some clipped samples here. Our peak, while it says zero, uh, my sound card was a bit forgiving here, but we actually have some clipped samples. So just a quick way to remedy that. If I just go to minus one here and drop this by about a decibel. All right we can eliminate that. Now, a better way, a more effective way to repair if we lost any transient detail in that process is to go into diagnostics. We're going to go into the declipper, going to restore normal, okay? Scan it. It's going to find these sections and it tells us there's actually 223 problem areas. Let's go and repair this, okay? Now, you didn't see much of a change, but what it just did is it kind of repaired those transients that peaked theoretically above zero, causing those clipped samples. And now if I just drag this down, you're going to notice something different, all right? It's not flat topped anymore. We actually still see peak information. All right, let's do this again so I can show. This is a really good, uh, this is a great learning lesson here. All right, so we've got clipped samples, okay? So you might think, all right, we'll just drop the amplitude, okay? But what happens when you do that is you can see that we're still effectively digitally clipped, all right? We've got, we've got the army haircut going on here, all right? So these transients, even though this is consistent, it's modulating, it's shifting over time. We, we, we've lost any of that attack detail, flat topped. So dropping the amplitude is not the way to do it. Instead, Go into the Diagnostics panel, Declipper. I'm going to go to Restore Normal. Scan it. Again, it finds all the problems. Repair it. All right. And now, if I simply drop the amplitude, all right, and we'll bring it just completely within range. We could also just normalize down to, say, point, you know, 0.5 dB, half of a decibel below zero. Do you see it now? It's not flat topped anymore. We've actually restored. We've fixed these digitally clipped transients. Now that may not seem very significant. It is. This is particularly useful and day saving 
when you've got like a, a voiceover or you're doing some dialogue or you're booming something and someone gets excited and there's that momentary, ah, and it, it just distorts for a moment. This is what that can fix. If you just drop the amplitude, literally, remember, anal uh, digital audio works in a negative logarithmic scale. Zero is as hot as you can get. So if you're pegging something at zero, you leave it there. If you say, all right, make it lower, it's still zero and it's still flat. It can't go any high. Even though you've brought it down, you've given it some headroom, it's just like with recording an 8-bit in uh, either photography or video. You know, the dynamic range is already, you can't go, you can't restore anything that was lost at the sensor in the camera. But here, with the D-Clipper, working in 32-bit float, you actually can. <laughs> All right, now this, this is a 24-bit native file anyway, but the point is we were able to restore those transients, right? It's going to sound better. It's not going to have that same crunchiness anymore. I'm going to go ahead and save that as a destructive change, right? I didn't want that to be this. Oh, and actually, I can see I need even more than that. Hold on. Let's go ahead and just downward normalize this. This is just an easier way because I can see on the right channel it was a little bit hotter. So yeah, half of a dB below zero. All right. And now what you see is there's two, there's two transient transients in particular that were kind of throwing this whole thing off. So this is something that we talk about a lot, right? Because of these two little articulations and they're low frequency. I'm playing something in the bass hand there. This is not allowing us to have quite as much amplitude. So while the respectable level, this is kind of peaking around minus four here approximately, is okay, I might want to, I might want to attack or fix these little sections right here. So there's a couple ways we can do it. A really quick and dirty way that works and you wouldn't hear this. So it's going to be, you won't perceive any real change in amplitude is just by limiting just this, just this little section right here to a specific decibel value. And let's go to the next closest one, which is around minus four. So I'm going to go in here and choose our hard limiter. I'm not going to add any boost. Go into minus four and apply. And just like that, we fixed that. Let's come back into this one here. We're going to do the same thing. Repeat the last command. No boost, minus four. And we'll do the same thing right here. All right. Maybe one last one right there. Okay. So now it's a bit more even. Again, you can actually see there's 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 a crescendo of sound. We're not peaking. If I rescan this now, all right, we've got about three and a half and two and a half decibels of headroom on the left and right, respectively. No clipped samples. Everything looks good. Uh, again, our average kind of listening level minus 15. I mean, that's that's pretty loud for again a cello section here, and this is great. All right, and this is now just going to sound a little bit more dynamic. It's going to sound better, and we're not going to have any any kinds of distortions in here whatsoever. Okay. All right. Oh, wow. We've only got about 10 more minutes. Okay. So we've got the strings. We've got the legato tremolos. Let's work now on the staccatos. Okay. Umicorn. That's helpful. I had some clip tops before with an audio file and had to use it as is because I didn't know how to fix it. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. And that's the thing, you know, um, diagnostics, it's not going to solve everything. It's not going to fix everything. But in many cases, uh, within about 10 or 12 dB. So if you're, if you're attack transient, and by the way, if it were continuously loud, like that Moog, you know, if you had that kind of a sound, 12 dB clipped for three seconds, it's not going to, it's likely not going to fix that. It's really for those <laughs> like short attacks. In fact, here, let's see if these staccatos have. Yeah, so look right here. Again, this is where amplitude statistics, I use this panel so much because it's so, so valuable. One of the many things that just sets Audition apart from other, um, other DAWs and other editors. All right. Theoretically, <clears throat> we're right at zero. But if you've watched me ever before, I'll, I'll be the first, you know, you never want to be at zero. <laughs> but 
But I was recording with a, with a virtual instrument, so it was hot. And, you know, again, uh, the, the sound device was forgiving, so it didn't go above zero. You'll sometimes see this above zero. But you can see we've got several hundred clip samples. Now, that may seem insignificant, and at 48K, we've got 48,000 per second. So yeah, 365 clip samples is not really a big deal. The thing is, when you start processing those, adding amplitude, adding compression, adding EQ, adding tube emulators, those little attacks that are clipped can do weird things, and it can make it sound bad, and it can just throw things off. So you really, you want to fix them. So again, now I'm going to choose a slightly different one. I'm going to go to Restore Lightly Clipped. Now this is effectively the same as Restore Normal, except it's going to identify the clip sections. So there's fewer on this one, okay? But it's also going to do the attenuation, the downward normalizing. It's going to do that for us, okay? So let's go ahead and repair all. Here, I'll zoom out so you can see exactly what it's doing. Let's do Repair All, okay? And you can see that it brought everything back down now within range. Go ahead and scan. And now you can see it's left us about 0.3 decibels of headroom on the left, a decibel of headroom on the right, no clip samples, restored. Sounds great. No distortion there. sounds really good. Let's save that. Now, and I know without even having to uh, audition it, this, this was an overdubbed piece right here. This has probably got the same problem, and sure enough, it does. All right, several hundred clip samples. Let's go into scan. Let's repair all. All right, same thing. Now, I'm not going to squeeze these down because these are really meant to be punctuated, and we're going to be able to control those, those changes in dynamics with compression. Let me go ahead and save this. All right, looking good. And now let's go into our mixer. Oh, did I close the mixer view? I guess I did. Oh, it's right there. All right, and let's, uh, let's start with a little bit of compression on this. All right, so again, now for this one, lots of options here. We have multiple compressors that we can use. Again, this type of audio compression is used to control dynamics, right? So if we really want to punctuate those They're already pretty punctuated. I'm playing them staccato, short, not legato, long. So very short. So it's already punctuated. But if I want to accentuate and really punctuate those attacks, we're going to use a compressor. Now, of all of these, uh, I would probably say the multiband and the tube modeled are the best for music. Dynamics processing is pretty good. It can get a little confusing. I'm not going to go with that one. So let's do the tube model compressor for right now. All right. Very simple uh, adjustment here. Again, we've got our uh, input metering, gain reduction metering, and then five standard settings, threshold, output, attack, release and ratio. That's it. All right. So a typical ratio for kind of classical, if we want to really kind of punctuate these, we're treating it almost like a base. So I'm going to do a five to one ratio. So that means that for every five decibels above the threshold, it's one dB at the output. All right. Which means that we have to, ex we got to see this, this meter right here, light up at least five or six to know that we're even compressing. So we've got to adjust that threshold accordingly. Uh, that attack is kind of fast. Let's do around a 28 millisecond attack. And we'll do about 150 millisecond release. All right. And let's take a listen and see what we got here. Now you see the red meter there, which is representing your gain reduction. So we're basically doing, we're, we're, we're hitting it about minus 12. That, so that means, again, for 5 dB above the threshold, one at the output. For 10 dB above the threshold, two at the output. So that's perfect. That's giving us a nice amount of compression. 
I was adjusting the release time because I want it to recover before the next note. So you can see I guessed around 150. We want to be around 136 so that each of those things doesn't linger. If you use a really long release, it's just going to kind of squish everything and it's not going to feel as, as, as punchy. So a faster release time uh, in time with the music in this case is going to keep it kind of almost pulsating, almost pumping, all right? This is the effect we want. And then I'm using the output gain here. When I was turning it on or off, effectively with good compression, you want the output gain after compression to be the same. It should sound the same at the output. If you want to give it a little boost though, to really, again, do, 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 really punctuate those attacks, give it a little bit more. Compressors are basically glorified amplifiers. So let's keep listening. Okay, yeah, so here, this is really good now. So here's without. It sounds good, but it's, it's just kind of flat, right? It's sort of very linear. Listen to it now with this kind of accentuated compression. Sounds really good. Okay. Nice. And I don't know why I've got that. Uh, I guess I must have just overdubbed this just like that so that, yeah, there's no, uh, there's no crossfade here. So let's do a fade in. Let's fade this one out. Weird. There shouldn't be any popping there. What is that? Okay. Oh, I see why. Because it's... I must have the overlap enabled. Okay, I'll fix that later. I'm, I'm talking out loud to myself. All right, well, we've only got another minute here, so we don't have enough time to finish everything. Let's keep the Moog out, but let's hear what we got so far, and I'll send you on your way. All right, let's take a look here. I was gonna try and do some, all right, you know, in my last minute, let me see if I can do this. All right, so I'm gonna quickly make a bus and send all of the music to this bus, all right? So from the output, I'm going to send legato there. I'm going to send staccato there. Let's keep the Moog out of there for right now. I'm going to send the reverb there. And that's everything. Oh, and these strings there as well. OK. Yes. OK. Yes. And then on this music bus, I'm going to add one more compressor. In this case, I'm going to choose my SSL comp stereo because I want to use this as a side chain. So when then the dialogue, when the person is talking, it's going to drop the amplitude of that music a bit. Now I don't have the time to go into all the settings here. I've made a little preset called duck the voice, which I'm going to leave right here. And then on the dialogue track under send one, I'm going to turn it on. I'm going to choose side chain like this. All right. Let's bring up the level here like that. Turn this on and then let's hear what this sounds like. What's going on? Where's my keys? 
Good cheese, good new cheese. Puppy food. I guess they didn't have any cheese. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. So this is the equivalent to ducking, right? But we're doing it via a side chain. So I'll get to talk more about that another time. But coming up next, we've got Andrew with the Illustrator Daily Creative Challenge. So until then, have a great weekend. Have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye-bye.